So if you want to lose weight, I, I really feel like the first thing we've got to look at is when you eat, not what you eat. Coffee may really help one person elongate their fast, and it may actually break the fast for another person. That's where we see people keep weight off for good because they're not, their body always wants to go back to ketosis and it's always burning fat, even though they just ate a meal two hours ago. Mindy, intermittent fasting is a term that's thrown around a lot in the health and wellness space these days. It's gained a lot of momentum, but for people who are tuning in, who are on the fence, you know, maybe they've heard of the term, they've thought about diving in. Let's get into some of the benefits to maybe give them that nudge they need to embrace this practice. The first thing I'm thinking is, why are people on the fence? Come on now. Uh, I have a lot of excitement about what intermittent fasting, fasting in general, can do for the human body. So um, my first thought really was like, people are on the fence. Everybody should be embracing this. So if you are on the fence, let me take you off the fence. Um, I think the easiest way to look at this is to understand that fasting is in our human design. We literally thrive with fasting. And if you go back to the caveman days, the cavewoman days, and you think about what happened in that moment, we didn't have a refrigerator, we didn't have a pantry, they didn't wake up in the morning and come out of the cave and be able to door dash coffee and breakfast to them. They had to go search for food. And a part of that ability to go search for food and have the mental clarity and the energy to be able to search for food, we had to dip into an alternate fuel source. And this alternate fuel source is called the ketogenic energy system. I like to call it the fat burner system, but basically when you go without food, you start to switch over into this fat burning place and you make a, a, a substrate called ketones. And it is in those that initial production of ketones that supercharges your brain, speeds up healing, has you burning fat like you've never seen before, uh, will fuel the mitochondria of every cell in your body because you were primally designed to be able to go be stronger so that you can go hunt for food in the absence of food. So it is literally in our makeup. And when we're not fasting, we're not tapping into this incredible design that we come equipped with. All right. Well, I think you've convinced at least a few people there. Let's talk about how long it takes of being fasted to get to that point where you become basically superhuman like you talked about there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this was a, a, a big debate when I wrote Fast Like a Girl, the editor that I was working with. We went back and forth on when do people go into the fasted state. And I'll tell you what the literature says, and then I'll tell you what I've seen in our community of hundreds of thousands of people. So you have to remember that when you're eating, you're operating from your sugar burner energy system, or we can call that glucose if you want to look at it in a more scientific level. You need glucose to start to come down and then dip even below your, your, your meal amount in order for you to switch over into fat burning. So it takes about eight hours is what the literature is saying for us to start to see that glucose has come down enough after a meal to start to move you into fat burning. So you're looking at about an eight hour time period. But that isn't really where the magic starts. At eight hours, you're now over into fat burning. If you stay in that fasted state going into 12 hours, 13 hours, now we got the supercharged factors kicking in. We are going to see testosterone go up and hormone uh, growth hormones go up. And all of a sudden, your body starts to go into that superhuman state, usually after 12 hours. So eight will get you there. 12 will start the supercharge moment. Well, let's really get into the details here. We got eight. We're getting into the supercharged. Let's push it further all the way to the extreme where it becomes unhealthy. Mm. I want to talk about the full continuum and what are some yeah. of the changes that happen in the body at these different phases? Yeah, it's it's a great question. So here's the, here's the best way I can explain it. Um, in the book, I, li I lay out six different fasts and they're all based off time. 
So intermittent fist fasting, most people know it as, you know, 13, 12 to 16 hours in that range somewhere. Um, we know that autophagy starts to kick in somewhere around 17 hours. The autophagy button will turn up, be turned on and the body starts to get rid of old cells and repair the inner workings of the cells that, that are salvageable. We know at 24 hours, we start to see stem cells that kick in and repair the gut. 36 hours, the body goes into this really accelerated fat burning state. 48 hours, we get the whole dopamine uh, system gets reset. You get new dopamine receptors that are that are born. And at Walter Longo taught us that 72 hours, you could reboot your whole immune system. So with that as a template, as that as a graph, what we can now say is which one of these fasts is best for me? Because this is a big part of Fast Like a Girl is that there's, you know, what might work for one person doesn't work for another person. You've got to decide what your intention is with fasting. And I think one of the biggest challenges we've seen in the fasting movement is everybody just dipped in and start stopped eating food, started, you know, powering up on bulletproof coffee, not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, and they just kept going, 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 not looking at setting a very specific intention to the length of their fast. So when I answer where does it go wrong, it goes wrong when in a couple of places. One, when we do the same fast over and over again. The classic example of this is one meal a day. You know, Jason Fung ignited the one meal a dayers, and it's amazing, and we're so grateful for his work. But you got to vary your fast. You're not, you shouldn't be doing one meal a day all the time. Um, the other place it goes wrong is in women, which is why I wrote a, a whole book on it, because women, sh there are times for a woman's hormones where she should be fasting. There's times where she shouldn't be fasting. And then I would say the last place that I see it go wrong or where we really need some assistance is um, if anybody's got some eating disorders, they need to be really coached through that process. This is not something that you want to enter into lightly. Pregnant women should not be fasting. Nursing women should be fasting only to a certain level. These are all things that I, that I map out in Fast Like a Girl. Yeah, that's a great framework for us to build the rest of this conversation. And you mentioned something there that really hit home for me as I was reading your book. I've been into intermittent fasting for a long period of time now, but basically do the same fast most days where I stop eating after dinner and then usually around lunch, I'll break that fast. So I'm doing yeah. whatever that would be. It's, it varies day to day, but that's the general trend. Yes. And what I want to get into here, and I'm excited about for myself and for the listeners, which isn't often talked about as much, is the fact that you can, again, for the right person at the right time, push it beyond that and gain these other benefits from doing some longer fasts. Yeah. So what I want to talk about first, you mentioned autophagy there. Talk about when that kicks in and what that looks like. Yeah. Oh God. It's, do you have 10 hours? <laughs> this is a highly debated uh, topic on all my socials because the research that I've seen is usually around 17 hours. Think of autophagy as a dimmer switch. So you start to turn the autophagy light on. It starts around 17 hours and it will peak at 72 hours. So somewhere between 17 and 72 hours, you have triggered autophagy. Now, autophagy, the best way to look at it is it's like you turn on an intelligence inside the cell. And that intelligence looks around the cell and says, okay, we've got some toxins inside this cell. We've got some bacteria and viruses inside the cell. We've got some cellular parts that aren't working well. And no food or nutrients are coming into the cell, so we better clean up our act. So that cell starts to repair itself. Now, in that moment, what the cell might decide is, wait a second, this cell is so bad that we need to kill it. It's a process called apoptosis. We need to get rid of it so it doesn't go rogue and form more disease. Remember that the whole premise of your body is it's built for survival. So when you stimulate autophagy, the survival instinct of the cells kicks in. And if there are cells that are going to hold back survival, they're going to get rid of them. If there are parts that need to be repaired, the intelligence is going to repair it. 
And this to me is the most beautiful part of fasting is you can access this repair without any money, <laughs> spending a dime, doesn't take any, any, any money. It is truly a gift that your intelligence has for you if you're willing to go into those longer hours. And you mentioned there's 17 hours being how long we need to fast to get to that point. Roughly, it's it's a dimmer switch, which is a great analogy. But for somebody who hasn't fasted to that point, which is probably a lot of people tuning into the show, is there other ways of getting there? Because obviously, this sounds like something we all need and want to you know clean up dead cells and parts within cells. Are there other things people might be doing outside of fasting that has a similar effect? Oh, for autophagy to stimulate yes. autophagy. Oh yeah, I mean, so here's here's the thing. Autophagy has become this kind of buzzword, and I love it. You know, it's really it's exciting that people are grabbing it. Um, there are a lot of ways. Red light stimulates autophagy. Um, cold plunges are stimulating autophagy. Uh, hit workouts stimulate autophagy. You are already stimulating autophagy when you sleep every night. The autophagy gets stimulated. All of these are great. We have supplement and nutrients that can stimulate autophagy. I get a lot of people ask me about spermidine and uh, nutrients like that. They're all great. But the greatest, the greatest autophagy stimulator is fasting. So those can all be wonderful. And fasting is really number one for stimulating autophagy. Let's talk more about the supplement piece. I want to I want to pause here and get into some of the nuances. Mm -hmm. When it comes to supplements, you mentioned spermidine. This is something that's come up on the show before. Is this something you use and advocate for? And then let's talk about other supplements during that fasting period we can use to ramp things up. Yeah. I don't normally, you know, here's the thing. We would rather take the supplement and get a, an enhanced experience than go through the work. And I am, everything that I'm teaching the world is I'm trying to teach us a lifestyle that taps into this intelligence. So I always want us to start with lifestyle first. I also have a strong belief that we've got, if we're going to overturn metabolic disease and metabolic syndrome in the world, we've got to have some free resources and fasting is that free resource. So I would encourage people to learn to train themselves to get to 17 hours. So that's, that's my first thing. Now, having said that, in the training process, sometimes there can be tools that are helpful. Spermidine is one. We know that spermidine is going to move you into this autophagy state a little quicker. It's like a little boost. It's a little supercharge. We also know coffee can do that. That's why, you know, I'm not telling people to take coffee out of their fasting window because clean coffee actually can stimulate autophagy. And, and now you're double stacking. Let's say you go, okay, I'm going to go 17 hours today. I'm going to do a cup of coffee and I'm going to do some spermidine. Now you've supercharged that autophagy effect in the body. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with supplements as long as we don't give the supplement the hero uh, identification. You get the hero uh, moment because it's your body doing the healing, not the supplement. The supplement is exactly that. It is supplementing your ability to get into these incredible states that your body already came pre-programmed with. I'm excited to share with you my favorite magnesium supplement, Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizers. Click the link in the description to save 10%. And now back to the show. For somebody who is, you know, getting to the 17 hours in their fast, cells are dying or they're repairing themselves. Let's talk about the physiology of what's happening specifically when a cell dies. So you've had this cell in your body, it's gone awry. We're pushing it with this stress of fasting. It dies. What happens to that cell in the body? Ooh, it's, such, it's such a well-stated question. I've been on a lot of interviews and nobody said it that way. So thank you. That was that that stimulated my my neuroscience brain. Um, you're, it's, we call it a senescent cell. So a senescent cell is an aging cell, and it and it also can be a disease-forming cell. And the longer we live on this planet, the more of these senescent cells we have. So when the body decides to stimulate apoptosis and get rid of it. It has to get it out through all of our detox pathways. So it's going to process it through the liver, depending on what, where the cell, cellular death is occurring. It's going to process it through the liver, the gut, the kidneys, um, uh, the skin. All of those places are what we call detox organs. But the most important part of all of detox is not necessarily the organ. It's the lymph system. We've got to be able to have an open lymph system as these cells are dying. 
So where we have seen problems in our community where somebody says, hey, I've got a rash, or all of a sudden I got diarrhea, or I got constipation, or I've got brain fog, these are all signs that perhaps the body, what it was doing as it got rid of the, the senescent cells, the pathways were not primed, they were not ready for that. And so all you got to do is take a step back, open up those pathways, and now it'll work really well. And I, in the new book, I put all, all of my uh, detox pathway hacks that we've ever seen work well. Well, let's get into some of them here. People can go into the book and get into the nuances, but for somebody who is going to get to that point and have to ideally make sure our detox system is working correctly, what are some of the things we can do? And does this possibly tie back to the supplement question, certain things we can take when we're pushing it to that point of fasting? Well, the, the first thing is binders, activated charcoal, like zeolites, like if you have a good binder and you're starting to get some of these symptoms, lean on a binder um, and at that moment, and that works incredibly well. So that would be the first thing. Um, the second thing would be, you know, making sure that you are doing some very simple detox things. Like, are you sweating on a regular basis? So you could sweat by going out and working out, or you, if you have an infrared sauna, get in the infrared sauna and sweat that way. So sweating is going to be a, a beautiful piece. Then we can go into dry brushing, you know, getting the, making sure you're getting all the dead cells off the skin. There are a lot of lymph manual lymph techniques. In our community, we like to really have women especially look at the armpit and look underneath the arm. Do you have a, do you have a puff under there? Or do you have a pit? It should be a pit. If it's a puff, then that's stagnant lymph. I have uh, a lot of the people in our community really focused on right above the collarbones. What's going on in that area? There's a lot of lymph gathering there. Is, is that swollen and puffy? If so, you're going to want to rub it and move that lymph. Getting massages, those kind of things are also going to make a big difference. So um, there's a lot you can do, but I would say my first go-to is binders. Like bind it up so that you can get it out of your body first, and then let's look at how to open those pathways up. Another really good easy one is um, that I think is castor oil um, and really rubbing some castor oil on your liver, opening that up. You could do a castor oil pack. So everybody's going to have a little different trick that's going to work. And for some people, one trick will work. And for others, they're going to have to do five to 10 tricks to open all that up. Let's come back to the coffee piece. A lot of people are drinking coffee. You mentioned healthy coffee. I think that's a really important caveat to this, organic mm -hmm. and, and pesticide-free. But let's take it even further and talk about other beverages or maybe even foods, things that we can have during the fasted state that technically don't break the fast. Mm. Yeah. So this is a great conversation. So the, believe it or not, I, have you ever heard of the term fasted snack? There's actually such a thing. In your book, yes. Yeah. So I found this in the research that I've done um, on fasting. I found this study that showed when people had a fasted snack, it allowed them to fast a little bit longer. So let's say they were going to go 13 hours. They have a fasted snack. Now they can go 15 hours and they're getting the same metabolic benefit as if they never had that fasted snack. And the, the requirements of the fasted snack are a pure fat bomb. Like it's, it's all fat. So finding a pure fat bomb can be difficult. So, you know, you, we tell people to lean into something like a little bit of an avocado and uh, you can do a little bit of nut butter. You could do a scoop of nut butter. Some people do a little bit of bone broth. Some people do, you know, a little bit of MCT oil on a spoon and just drink it. So there are fasted snacks like that. But what most people do is their coffee. And I think this is a really good tool. Dave Asprey and I have had numerous conversations about this. Um, he's a believer of like adding probiotics into that and prebiotic fibers to feed your microbes, putting a lot of butter and MCT oil in clean coffee. He strongly feels will help you elongate that fasting window. And I would say there's some truth to that. Um, you definitely want to get out of this idea that there's an absolute for any, everybody, because what we've seen with coffee 
is that coffee may really help one person elongate their fast and it may actually break the fast for another person. So you, how all of what, how that is determined is really by your microbiome. Your microbiome is going to, those bacteria in your gut are going to be the regulators of blood sugar when that coffee hits it. And we all have unique microbiomes. So um, we really want to make sure that we test our own blood sugar. And I, I, you, you, do you know that test? What test are you talking about? A CGM was, or? No, uh, checking your own blood sugar pre and post um, uh, coffee to see if coffee works for you. I, don't, I didn't want to repeat it. If uh, No, if I, it's not something I've done before. I've worn a CGM and, and watched my blood glucose over a period of time. But are you talking about like a classic finger prick? Yeah, so you can do a CGM, you can do a finger prick, but this is the blood this is the test to see if coffee works for you. Is that you Yeah, you it it, it ta- you take a blood sugar reading and then you drink your cup of coffee. Half hour later, take another bl- blood sugar reading. You can do it on a pin prick, you can do it on a CGM, totally up to you. And what you're looking for is those two numbers to be almost exactly the same. The second number should be very similar to that first number. If for some reason the second number after the cup of coffee, it drops, the blood sugar drops, um, that's okay because that might have moved you more into the fasted state. It's if it if it elevates. And then the question becomes, well, how much elevation takes you out of a fasted state? And I say anything over a five-point difference of b- blood sugar elevation um, has now taken you out of the fasted state. So for example, if your blood sugar is 100 before the cup of coffee, and then a half an hour later, it's 110 after the cup of coffee, it's pulled you out of a fasted state. That's so interesting. And from your estimation and working with people, how many people would this affect? It, you know, I wish we had numbers on that, but I would say it's more than you would think. And I and I can only say based off of myself, because your microbes are always changing. Your, your microbiome is always adapting to your environment. So one of the things that I've noticed is sometimes coffee doesn't pull me out of a fasted state and sometimes it does. And it's all based off of those little, those little super microbes in your our gut. They're determining it. So I would say it's more common than you would think. Um, and you know, it really goes to what are you trying to do with your fast? You know, some people are purists and they're like, okay, I'm not going to do coffee. And other people are like, I want to make this a lifestyle. It's super helpful. So I've got to find a rhythm with it. That's going to work for me so that I can fast a little longer. Mindy, at this point, I think it'd be interesting to hear what you do during a fast. What does that look like for you? Yeah. So, um, I, I, I'm, my mind works the best in the morning. So I'm a get up early, get as much accomplished before noon kind of gal. And so I find food slows me down. And so I like to, um, be, stay in that fasted state largely in the morning. And then I eat my dinner pretty, I try to get it done, um, around, around the sunset. And we can talk about why I, I time dinner according to light in a moment, if you want. Um, so, I do like to drink different things in my fasted window. And um, coffee, I do do coffee. I've been doing less of it um, and largely just to see how it reacts to my hormones uh, and see if there's any shift I can see in my hormones. I've been throwing in some mushroom coffee lately, mixing it in with my clean coffee. Um, and I, and I really like that. I'll throw some raw cream and a little MCT oil into a a, a mug that's got mushroom coffee, a little splash of clean coffee, um, and some hot water and MCT oil. And that, that is most of the time that is my morning routine. Um, and then about 10, I'll reach for a glass. Like I have it here. I've got a glass of aminos. So I'll put some powdered aminos in a, in a glass of water um, and aminos are great, uh, for everything, uh, hormones, neurotransmitters. Um, and I find that it helps me stay in a fasted state longer. And then about noon, if I, and sometimes I'll throw some exogenous ketones in if I'm, if I'm wanting to like, you know, supercharge my brain. Um, and then around noon, I decide, am I going to, fa- am I going to break my fast or not? 
And there are three things I recommend people break their fast with. And one of them is fat. You know, you can just go, I can go into a big cup of bone broth. I could do the fasted snack routine. And sometimes that'll carry me all the way till four o'clock when I, when I'll dive into a, a bigger meal. Um, so, you know, other times I'll break my fast with protein. If I just finished working out and I want to really power up, uh, the, my muscles, then I will break my fast with protein. So, that's, that's kind of like a, a morning. I'm always doing drinking something, um, maybe hacking something with a supplement like aminos. Um, uh, and and it, it really seems to work for me. Let's come to the daylight piece then. You mentioned timing your dinner with daylight. What time do you eat and why do you do it that way? Okay, so here's what I, th- I think is a really big thing everybody should know. When the sun goes down, melatonin goes up. We know this. But when melatonin goes up, you become more insulin resistant. So the better, the sooner you can eat a meal or before sunset or around sunset, before melatonin makes her debut, you are going to process from an insulin sensitivity level, you're going to process that meal much more effectively. So I try to get my that meal in around sunset. Now it's you know where it is by me right now. It's winter time. It's getting dark around six o'clock. So I got I'm working to get my meal in around five, um, and it's purely from that insulin sensitivity standpoint. Now, if you I want to point out, if you are listening to this, um, I really want to say that if you're I've worked with a lot of families where they're like, well, I don't come home from soccer practice with the kids until eight o'clock at night. The whole goal of fasting is to make it fit your lifestyle. So if you hear that and you're like, there's no way I can finish eating dinner by five, six o'clock, then just build it, build your fasting lifestyle around what works best for you. And when you talked about breaking your fast, I think you mentioned having fat. What are some of the other options for people that have been pushing it, you know, even a, a typical intermittent fast or when they start pushing it longer? What are your recommendations for safely breaking that? Well, if you if you go longer than th- if you go to three days, even if you go to two days of fasting, you want to really be methodical about how you break it. And I have a four step approach to breaking a fast that I recommend works really well. And it starts with doing some bone broth. I think bone broth on the longer fast is amazing to break your fast with because it has glycine in it and it'll really repair any leaky gut situation. So I have people start with bone broth. If you're a vegetarian, you can do like a, a, a vegetable broth. Then if you're feeling good at that point, you can move into um, some prebiotic or probiotic foods. Um, uh, one of my favorite is uh, I'll do a combo of like avocado with some sauerkraut on it and then throw a little bit of hemp seeds and maybe some chia seeds on it to get that prebiotic piece in there. Um, so you really want to think about your microbes next. Then I'll have people test it with uh, steamed vegetables. And if all is well after that, you can go into meat. So that that's for the longer fast. For the shorter fast, again, we're back at like, what is it that you're trying to do? I'm a big fan these days of people breaking the shorter fast with protein. And, and let me tell you why. When we stimulate autophagy, we turn off something called mTOR. And mTOR is the growth part of our body. And it's what grows muscles. And muscles, I am a a thousand percent behind this idea that muscle is your organ of longevity. You also have to remember that muscles, the more muscle you have, the more insulin receptor sites you have. So you're going to be able to take in glucose in a a deeper way if you have more insulin openings, more of these gates within the muscle. But here's the trick. To stimulate mTOR, you got to get at least 30 grams of uh, protein at that first meal. So it triggers an amino acid receptor. It stimulates mTOR in a positive way. So I'm a big fan of protein. Um, In the book, I I map out three different things, but I would say right now protein's my favorite for the shorter fast. For the longer fast, follow, definitely follow that protocol that I gave. You mentioned 30 grams of protein. Just to give us a ballpark idea, what would that look like? Well, eggs are some of my favorite. Um, Eggs have so much in them, but you would have to do about six eggs to get 30 grams of protein. So um, if, you know, I I know we're, this is a podcast, so it's hard to see, but you're looking, you know, you're looking at about a, um, I think recently I saw it was like a a, a six or seven ounce steak. 
um, that, you know, you, you, you look at whatever, if you're eating chicken, you're eating steak, just Google how many ounces is 30 grams, but you're looking at about a seven ounce steak. We've gotten into a lot of the nuances of intermittent fasting. I'm curious, Mindy, how did you first stumble upon it? Where was this along your health journey and what brought you in? Yeah, that also is a good question. Um, you know, I actually went searching for my perimenopausal answers at 43. I, I was the classic person who at 40 was like exercising like long hours. Like I, Sunday mornings were a two hour run with my friends. Um, I was eating all day. I think I might have been paleo at the time. I was taking a ton of supplements. I was, I mean, everything I could possibly do for my health, I felt like I was doing. And that was at 40. By 43, I hadn't changed anything. I hadn't changed anything. And all of a sudden, I started getting hot flashes. I started having trouble sleeping. I started having some mood challenges, energy challenges, and I started gaining weight for no particular reason. And um, so that's when I discovered uh, Dr. Osumi at the time had come out, had just been uh, recognized for and given the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology for this concept of autophagy. So I dove into what it was, and that led me, you know, down rabbit holes of research. And what I found at that at 43, so that was 10 years ago. I'm 53 now. Um, what I found was that fasting became this tool that not only helped me get my weight back on track, not only helped my hot flashes, not only helped sleep, but supercharged my brain in, in, in a way that I had never experienced in my entire life. And so I'm, I'm just the type of person that when I love something, I can't shut up about it. It's a little bit of a, of a, of a challenge if, you're, if you live in my close sphere. Um, and I just brought it to the world and started teaching people on YouTube how to fast. And like within a month period, my YouTube channel blew up with stories of people saying, I'm fasting, this is working, this is incredible. And here we are, you know, I think we're at like 30 million views later on that channel. Um, the stories keep pouring in about how incredibly effective it is. So that was my door in. That is incredible. And you mentioned the mental aspect quickly there, how it just lit your brain up and you were thinking clearer. Talk more about that before and after and what it was like being able to access parts of your brain that were dormant before. Yeah. You know what was what I did the three o'clock crash. Like I was the person who at three o'clock, I would, I couldn't think straight. I was tired. Um, I was in practice at the time and we would have a morning shift and an afternoon shift with a big lunch break. So um, prior to fasting, I would come home and I would have to take a nap. And then I would at, like drag my body into my clinic and then I would see a whole slew of patients in the afternoon and I focus was a challenge. Energy was a challenge. I just, I was sleepy all the time. That literally changed in it like the first two weeks of fasting. Like that was insane. I would say the second thing that changed for me um, was just the overall ability, cognition, the ability to hold on to information. So what we now know about fasting is that it not only repairs decaying neurons in the brain, but that it can actually upregulate BDNF, which is uh, like, think of it like mir miracle grow for your brain, and it will actually start to grow you new neurons. So in the 10 years I've been applying this fasting lifestyle, I strongly feel like, you know, I hold on to information better than I ever did in my entire life. And I don't know, I don't think most 53-year-olds are saying that. This is a time when we start worrying about dementia and Alzheimer's, and my brain is, 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 is better neuronally equipped than ever because of a decade of fasting. So you talked about being in your early 40s when you stumbled upon fasting. You're going through at least a mini health crisis at the time. What we haven't done to this point is talk about fasting for special populations. We touched on it, you know, fasting for women, but we haven't gotten into what that looks like. So what I'm curious, you're in perimenopause at the time. What did you do when you got into fasting? And then all the knowledge you've learned over the last 10 years, what would you recommend to somebody in perimenopause that is different than your quote unquote average person. Yeah. Well, so the first thing I want to say is thank you for for um, asking this question because the perimenopausal years are really difficult and they require different attention for sure. So, um, and here's the the simple way that I can answer this 
is that estrogen does really well with fasting and it does really well with keeping glucose low. If you go into keto and you fast when estrogen is coming in, surging into your body, you are going to really help with estrogen production. Progesterone, completely the opposite. If you go into fasting, if you go into keto when progesterone is making her debut, you are going to tank progesterone. So when we look at what happens in the perimenopausal years, which for me, perimenopausal years is, I used to say it started at 40, but we're seeing evidence now it's even starting in the mid 30s. And what happens is estrogen is doing this wild ride. Estrogen is high one day, it tanks the next. Up one day, tanks the next. For the perimenopausal woman, this is stressful. Like, you know, you feel normal one day, the next day you're like, who hijacked my brain and body? So when we're looking to regulate uh, estrogen for the perimenopausal woman, more fasting. That, and, and, and you want to time it to your cycle. This is what Fast Like a Girl is all about, is how do you time the, your, the length fast and how do you time the low carb to the right hormone? And it's for all ages that way. Peri, uh, uh, progesterone, it, it, it just starts tanking at 40 and it just goes down, 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 down. So that makes a perimenopausal woman feel anxious. It makes her, um, her hair start to thin out. So we hear about the hormonal hair a lot. Um, it makes her body have trouble relaxing. It makes her hard to sleep. And that's all because of progesterone. So the first recommendation for these perimenopausal women is we've got to start tracking our cycle. And I would say around 45, I started tracking my cycle for like the first time in my life, which was hysterical. Um, we should be tracking our cycle at 13, not starting at 45. And um, I started mapping that the where I was in my cycle. And when I was in around day 20 of my cycle, I stepped out of fasting and I went into carb loading. And carb loading for, for helping progesterone doesn't look like a box of pizza or a tub of ice cream. It looks like more root vegetables, more potatoes, um, tropical fruits, citrus fruits. These are not keto foods. But when we go to seduce uh, progesterone to come out and, 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 and help us out as perimenopausal women, we've got a not fast and we've got to raise glucose so that we can make progesterone. Okay. I want to make sure we get into the details here. So I fully understand. So I think actually let's take a step back first and talk about before perimenopause. We'll come back to perimenopause and make sure we have everything sorted there, but let's talk about during a regular cycle, how the hor you've already touched on hormones and how they change in the cycle, but let's get into it in a general sense and how somebody before hitting perimenopause and menopause wants to look at their, in your book, you do a 30 day cycle and how we want to incorporate fasting throughout that. And then we'll move into later in life. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see how complicated it was to write this book? <laughs> You've got a lot of women at a lot of different phases. And, and sadly, we have a lot of 20-year-olds that are not even cycling um, because of environmental impacts. So uh, let's, to answer your question, here's, how, here's the simplest way to understand it. Um, from day one, which day one, a lot of women don't totally get that day one is the first day you're officially bleeding. Like you've got to use some feminine care products. It's not spotting, it's bleeding. So from day one to day 10, estrogen is starting to build. You can go low carb, you can fast. I call it in the book, I call it a power phase. I think all the, the names of hormones are so complicated, nobody can understand them. So I decided to rename the different phases. And the power phase is when you can power up on fasting. So day one to day 10, estrogen's coming in. Go ahead and go keto, go ahead and fast. Day 11 to day 15, you've got estrogen at her highest and you've got this incredible five-day period where testosterone came in and it's at its highest and you have a little bit of progesterone coming in. So in the book, I call it the manifestation phase because I'm. these are our superpowers. We can manifest anything we want with all these hormones coming in, but we've got to make sure we don't fast too long during that time because progesterone is there. 
And just because you make a hormone doesn't mean you break it down. So we've got to be able to have a good amount of fiber coming in, a good amount of prebiotic, probiotic fuel to help the gut break these hormones down. So in this ovulation window, I tell people 15 hour fast, like maximum if you're an expert faster, don't go more than that. And you don't want to be in keto. You, you want, you know, a lot of people go into keto and they forget about vegetables and fruit. You want to go more into more fruits, more vegetables, more of what I call the hormone feasting foods. Then when we come out of that period, we go back into another power phase. Uh, day 16 to about day 19, you can go keto again. Those hormones have dropped. And so you can go back to a very similar approach to the beginning of the cycle. And then about day 20, that's when we're, we stop doing keto and fasting. We bring glucose back up. You even want to st stop cortisol from surging. Um, and in the book, I call it the nurture phase. You really want to nurture yourself. Um, but again, nurturing yourself with a tub of ice cream is not nurturing yourself. It's, it's called a dopamine rush. So, um, so that's kind of how we do it. It's like an in and out sort of variation, um, that works the best with, with women's hormones. All right. Let me make sure I have this. So this is for yeah. women from when they start their period to about 35, they have a 10 day phase, the first power phase where they can go into keto and they can fast longer and harder. Then there's about a five day period where, they have to let up a little bit. They can still fast, but not aggressively, as aggressively as before. Then there's a few days where you can go back into the power phase, keto diet, fasting a little bit harder. Then the last 10 days of that 30-day cycle, we're not going to fast anymore. We're going to be more gentle on the body. And then it begins all over again. Yeah. Yeah. You got it. You got it. You got it. And it's so interesting because, you know, as women... We, we bitch about our the week before our cycle all the time. We're like, I'm cranky. I don't feel like doing anything. I would just crave chocolate. Um, I want to eat more carbs. And my answer to that is, yeah, yeah, because that's what progesterone is demanding. Let's just do it from a healthy twist now. So, um, yeah, you nailed it. All right, let's come back into perimenopause now, and then we're going to go into menopause, make sure we get the full spectrum here. So perimenopause, we went into this, but uh, now with our new knowledge of, of how things work in a general sense, it sounds like during that period of time, the hormones are a bit erratic. Let's talk about how somebody, a woman during this phase can understand the changes going on and what that means for fasting. Yeah, this is, and literally this is the hardest one uh, to, to really map out. So um, let me try to make it as simple as possible. So given that you just learned what I called the fasting cycle, what I just taught there, what most perimenopausal women, if you're 43 and you have a normal cycle, you're just going to follow the routine I just gave you. So you just, and that, and what, this was actually my journey is that I got so excited about fasting that at about 46, 47, my cycle completely stopped. And I was like, wait a second, is that, in, is that what it's supposed to be doing? I ran a hormone test on myself and found out that all my hormones were tanked because I wasn't doing what I just explained around the fasting cycle. So if you have a 30 day or a 28 day cycle, go ahead and do it the way I just said it. Here's where we have a problem. As you get closer to going into menopause, you have a 60-day cycle. Or you have a, uh, I just had a 166-day cycle where I was like, okay, I'm going into to menopause. And then all of a sudden, my period showed back up. So um, what do you do in those moments? And here's, here's the easiest way I can explain it, is you want to get to know the characteristics of your hormones. And it's really estrogen and progesterone. So for the perimenopausal woman, if you don't have a cycle to track to, let's take the principles. If you start spotting, that is your body saying, hey, I need more progesterone. So you go through the fasting cycle, you hit day 30, and nothing's happened, maybe on day 34, all of a sudden, you, so you decide to go into more fasting and more keto, and then all of a sudden you start spotting. The minute spotting shows up, that's progesterone trying to make her appearance. Let's stop fasting. Let's raise glucose. The other thing we know about progesterone for perimenopausal women is you stop sleeping well. You're having horrible nights and you can't sleep then, okay, we need to step out of fasting for a couple of days and lean into more of these progesterone-building, hormone-building foods. Um, 
The other thing that we have seen, again, is we can go back to the hair. Hair starts getting thin. You start getting more anxious. The, you start getting more hungry in the morning. That's progesterone all of a sudden saying, hey, feed me. So you really want to know your progesterone um, uh, personality, and you also want to get a hormone test. I think everybody should get a hormone test so you know where you are. Estrogen, you know you're going to want, for a, a perimenopausal woman, you want to go into more of the keto and fasting path when estrogen is needing to, some support. So when you know estrogen is out of balance, it looks like this. Skin gets really dry. Mucosal membranes, your, your nasal cavity, vaginal area, completely dry. Um, cognition, you can't quite hold on to inform information the way you want and hot flashes. Those are some of the biggest we see when estrogen has now made a big dip or is on this big roller coaster. On days like that, you're going to want to throw more fast at it to clean up that estrogen system. So it's the it tracking is important, but knowing these two personalities and then getting a hormone test is really helpful. Um, I've even seen in our community where some women will get do like an ovulation kit so they can actually kind of start to see where they are. Some, some of the women in our community use the aura ring or, or any kind of biometric or whoop, anything like that, will, which will show you that all of a sudden your heart rate var variability goes up. That's a sign of progesterone coming in. Um, some women use CGMs as, as they'll just out of nowhere see that their glucose is higher. That's progesterone trying to give you a clue. It needs some more support. So that that's that. There's a lot of nuance for the pre, the prairie menopausal woman. Well, that's what I was going to get into. It sounds like at that point in your life, you need to be really tuned into your body, and there's a lot of subjective that you need to be paying attention to, and it's not as regimented as yes. before in life. That's right. That's right. And yet it. I can tell you as a woman who's gone through these perimenopausal years, fasting saved me. I mean, I have no idea mentally, physically, like where I would be. Um, so I don't want women in those years to shy away from fasting. I just really want women to get to know their hormones. And this is, we have a hormonal literacy problem in this world. So this is a great time to really get to know the characteristics of these two hormones. Part of your healing journey, and this ties into the fasting, is an Achilles tendon injury. And mm -hmm. part of the healing of that, it was a nagging injury that went on. Talk about when that occurred and how fasting mm -hmm. helped you heal that. Yeah. Yeah. I love this story. Um, so, I, you know, I had this, my, well, the, the prelude to that story is my husband had pulled his Achilles tendon. He's a soccer player. And I watched how incredibly difficult that was. And about a year after he pulled his tendon, I started to feel some nagging on my my Achilles, my left Achilles. And I'm a runner. I love running. It's my, it's my drug of choice. And so I was like, if I pull my Achilles and, and I'm not able to run, I may go crazy. So I tried everything. I mean, I tried every biohack. I tried every uh, chiropractic massage. Like for months, I tried supplements. Nothing was moving the needle. So at last resort, I decided, okay, let me go back to the principles of fasting. What I know is on day three, you're going to get a stem cell boot into your body. And what I know about the body is that it's so intelligent, it will know where to put those stem cells. So let me hope that I can stimulate stem cells and that the body figures out where to put it. So I, on day three... I still felt the pain. Day four, still felt the pain. I decided to keep fasting. To, you know, Once the stem cell production is in, I've got now days where I'm getting stem cells surging through my body. On day five, there was a buzz that started happening in my Achilles. And I went all the way to the end of day five. By the end of day five, the pain was completely gone. And w that buzz continued for months. And to this day, I have never felt the pain again. So the, the way that I look at that is I turned on two days of stem cell production. Now, I could have paid $10,000, $20,000 to get a stem cell injection in there, but I was able to accomplish that just by going into this longer fast. Let's talk about the timeline of stem cells when it comes to fasting, because the way I understood it from your book is you get earlier stem cells, I think, in the gut, and then further along, you get more of a systemic effect from them. 
Yes, bingo. So the the research on the gut, I want to point out, it, it's a mouse study. It's not a human study, but it was out of MIT. And what we know is that 24 hours, stem cells will kick in in the intestinal tract and start to repair the gut. I have a feeling that it may come in a little bit earlier for humans, um, just based off of what I've seen and my own personal experience. So for any antibiotic use, any women that have been on birth control for years, uh, people who are struggling with leaky gut, uh, throwing a 24-hour fast once a week, uh, once every couple of weeks at your body, it has to be, you know, get it true, as true to 24 hours as possible is going to have that systemic gut repair. It's going to create that gut repair you're looking for. But then we know at 72 hours, based off of Walter Longo's, that he, his research showed us that white blood cells, the old white blood cells were sloughed off starting at 72 hours and new ones are formed. And it's in that stem cell production that we see these new white blood cells form. So systemically, it happens at about 72 hours. Now, the longer you stay in a fast, why I stayed two more days is it's a switch. So I knew at 72 hours that that stem cell switch was going to turn on. It may have come a little bit earlier, but then my brain thought, well, let me keep it on and see what my body does with these stem cells. And that's where on that fifth day, I saw a, a, a correction and a healing happen. Now, depending on how bad an injury is, depending on what you're trying to heal, you might have to stay in longer or shorter, and this is, really becomes personal preference at that point. When I mentioned the intestinal stem cells, it got me thinking about something else in your book I hadn't heard anybody else talk about, and that's the mobility of the microbiome that changes when we fast. So I'd love for you to talk about what happens there and why that's important. Yeah, you got you got all the juicy parts of the book. I love it. Um, so yeah, you know, there's a, something called um, geographical uh, relocation um, that happens in the body where all of our microbes start to clump together in our intestinal tract. And when they're clumped together, what will happen is that they're not able to absorb our nutrients as much. And I, I learned this from Emron Mayer. I don't know if you've ever, if you've had him on your podcast, he wrote a book called Gut Immune Connection. And do, have you had him on your podcast? I'm aware of him. He's on the yeah. list to look into trying to get on the show, but not yet. Yeah, it was really he, it was a really interesting discussion about how when we take these microbes in the gut and we get them out of these clumps and we start to get them so that they can start to spread out more, we actually are going to absorb our nutrients from our foods better. So like if you're struggling to get more B vitamins, you're struggling to get um, you know some of the minerals like magnesium, you're trying to pull this out of your food, you need those microbes to not be clumped together. So fasting m helps them d d uh, unclump and become more separate so that that, n that um, nutrient uh, absorption can happen. So that's the first thing. The second thing I would say that happens in the gut is any bad bacteria, the longer you fast, will die off. So this is where you start to see people who get diarrhea and constipation. All that is, is the bad stuff dying off. Now, here's what's key. And one of my pet peeves in the fasting world is that people say, well, fasting's bad for your microbiome. And what I want to say is fasting changes your microbiome. And in that change, you're going to see a lot of die off. You're going to see this relocation of the microbes. You're going to see this whole shift happen in the gut. And now what you need to be able to do is feed these microbes the right foods. So make sure you're doing enough polyphenol, probiotic, prebiotic foods so that you can sustain that new environment that you've given your body through fasting. So that there's two sides to the microbe question when it comes to fasting. It's, it's what's happening when you're fasting and what are you reintroducing to keep those microbes thriving? You mentioned there the bad bacteria dying off during a fast, which is great for us, but I'm curious why it's not more of like an antibiotic impact when we're not putting food in there for the bacteria. Like why do the good guys survive and not the bad? 
Well, I think what it does is, you know, the way I look at it is the good guys change the internal environment. So what the, ends up happening is you're going to change the pH in the gut. And depending on which part of the gut you're talking about, when I say gut, it's stomach, small intestine, and large intestine. They all have different impacts when we're looking at fasting. But you're going to change the pH. Uh, you're going to change the microbes location. So that's going to start to happen. And that's going to be very unfavorable for for these bad bacteria. They thrive in conditions that are are maladaptive, that are not good. That's where they're going to thrive. So now you've changed the internal environment, so they die off. The good bacteria, you may lose. I've had a lot of discussion with experts about, do you kill any of the good bacteria when you're fasting? And my guess is you probably lose some good bacteria too. I can't find the research showing that they are, sh are saying that it's harmful to the good bacteria. But I like to, to really remind people that you've changed the environment to, to allow the good bacteria to thrive. So it's the environmental shift that is causing the bad to go and the good to thrive. And in that actual shifting, you may lose a few good, but the environment's there for them to regrow again. And when it comes to fasting and shifting that environment for the good guys and also the unclumping, how long does that take? It's I, that's a million dollar question. Um, I, you know, I would say if we look at research, it really is that twenty four hour. It's getting to that twenty four hour. And I, I can tell you from clinical experience, I've worked with a lot of patients who have had SIBO. But SIBO to me is the hardest thing to um, to help somebody with. And SIBO, when I put a patient with SIBO into these 24-hour fasts, we get a better shift in their SIBO symptoms than any supplement I, I could ever give them. So um, it depends on what you're trying to go after. Um, one of my big concerns, and Stephen Gundry and I have talked about this numerous times, he really uh, looks at leaky gut as um, what causes the energy slump that so many people get. And when I look at leaky gut, especially in women, I think of chronic years of birth control use. I think of multiple rounds of antibiotics. I think of uh, uh, foods you know, lathered in glyphosate. All of that is causing this leaky gut situation. And I think some of the shorter fast, just a woman building a fasting lifestyle over time will heal a leaky gut. But when we need to heal something like SIBO, we definitely need to go into the longer fast, like 24 hours. Earlier, Mindy, you talked about the fact that when you started intermittent fasting, you got these benefits mentally. You were able to think better and sharper. Early on in our conversation, you mentioned dopamine. And this is, again, something I haven't heard other people talk about. The fact that when we push a fast, I think this is one of the longer fasts, we actually impact the dopamine system in the brain. So yeah, talk about right. that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's another really good one. So, um, what I found in research, and this was years ago, uh, researching for my YouTube channel was, uh, several studies that show when you put somebody into a fasted state at 48 hours, you reboot the, um, the dopamine system. And what I mean by reboot is that you start to not only open up the dopamine receptor sites that may be saturated, but you are also creating new D2 receptor dopamine. There's several types of dopamine receptors. It's specifically the D2 receptors. Um, are, you create new ones. Now, this study was originally done on people who are obese. So what they found is that overeaters, people who had food addiction problems, that when they were eating, they were not getting the same dopamine experience. So what they did is they took food out of the equation for 48 hours, and then they measured their dopamine system, and they saw these new receptors, they saw the whole dopamine system reboot itself, but then when they put these individuals back into a fed state, they enjoyed their food more, and so they, they weren't needing to eat so much to get the same dopamine high. So from that research, I started looking at people who have mental health challenges. And so I went to my community and I was like, 
let's practice this 48 hour and let's see those of you that have anxiety, those of you that have depression, you know, uh, for, I'm, I'm obviously a little more partial to women and how the benefits that can happen for women, especially perimenopausal women, there's a lot of depression that kicks in the, those years. I've heard so many women say, I don't know why I just don't feel joy the way I used to feel joy. And that's because that dopamine system has gotten so mucked up. So what we saw in, in our community was when we threw a 48-hour fast, the months after that fast, these women were experiencing more joy. So it, we see it in the literature, but it was built around the obese individual. And then now we've seen it with hundreds of thousands of women in our community. And it's, it's pretty profound that I think I, I, maybe you read this. What's really cool is when we go into these longer fasts, we get more ketones. And as ketones go up, that elevation of ketones actually makes more GABA. And so you're, you become calmer the longer you fast. So if you can get that calm, give an anxious person or a depressed and anxious person the ability to stay calm as they go into a 48-hour fast, reboot this system, now when they come out of it, they're going to have a different uh, approach to their mental health challenges. And did you mention before when we're fasting, the BDNF gets stimulated as well? Yes. And BDNF will, BDNF, you know, the, the, the research that I can find on BDNF really came from Ramadan. So, um, which is, I don't, I don't, I didn't put this fast in the book, but um, dry fasting is what you're really looking at with Ramadan. It's sun up to sun down and it's done over 30 days and it's no food or water. And, and, and it's in all the research, it shows about 12 hours um, is where you see BDNF come in at that point. Um, but I think it comes in in other areas for sure. And just ask anybody who fasts and, and, and their ability to hold on to information is just incredible when you're in that. I, I think of it like, did you ever see that movie Limitless with Bradley Cooper? Yeah. And he takes the ago. little pill. Yeah. And he can like speak six, you know, all these languages and predict the stock market. That's what I feel like fasting does for you. It gives you that li limitless feeling. And part of that is BDNF um, doing its magic on your brain. A subject closely related to fasting, we've been focused on fasting, having periods where we're not having any food or drinks other than what we talked about before. But how do you feel about calorie restriction? Yeah. There's talk of that helping with longevity. So in this case, we're, we're not being mindful of when we're having the calories, but we're just taking that calorie load down. So yeah. can you compare and contrast the two, fasting versus yeah. that and how you feel about both? Obviously, we yeah. know how you feel about fasting, but the calorie <laughs> yeah. restriction. It's such a good question. So calorie restriction is hard. Let's just, let's just be, let's just call it out. And it's hard to sustain, um, which is why so many diets fail. Um, so yes, the research on, on longevity and calorie restriction is impressive. And we've known that for many years, it's just hard to sustain. The other problem that we have and Jason Fung really brought this to our attention was that when we decrease calories and we increase the output of energy, we actually start to change a set point. So every dieter knows this. You eat less, exercise more, you start to lose weight, and then you get burnt out, hard to sustain. So you go back to your old ways and you put the weight back on. The reason that happened was because you changed your set point. So when we look at the benefit of calorie restriction, you can still get calorie restrict, be calorie restriction if that's like your jam, you would just need and do it within a fasting window. For me, fasting is time restriction. And I personally don't think once you open up your eating window, you should count calories. But if you are sitting in the camp of I'm a calorie restriction person, that is what I'm going to do then um, more power to you if you can sustain it, sustain it long term. And to avoid the set point change, you may want to put it in a certain time period. I feel like what brings a lot of people to intermittent fasting is the weight loss piece. And this ties into calorie restriction because that's typically how people, quote unquote, lose weight. That's part of most diet plans, you know, exercise more and, and cut the calories. Yep. So for somebody, we're going to steer away from calorie restriction for now. We, we touched on that. And I think that's enough for that one. But when it comes to fasting, 
for somebody that's tuning in right now and, and their primary goal, at least to start, is to lose weight, given what we've talked about to this point, how would you modify things fasting and outside of fasting for somebody to really kickstart losing weight? Yeah, I mean, I I think we want to train our bodies to fast um, and we want to know as when you are on your fast, starting your fasting journey, knowing why you're fasting is so incredibly helpful because it helps you start to take all of your food and compress it into the eating window. So let me tell you, um, let me explain the answer to that through a really cool interaction that I had with a man that was 300 pounds this summer. He came to me and he asked me to help him because he was like, I'm dying. I'm metabolically so unhealthy. I'm dying and I need your help. And when we broke down where his hurdles were, he had a massive food addiction problem. And it was to the standard American diet and drinking lots of soda all day long. So I knew if I took soda away, I knew if I started to make diet changes, I was just going to be another way that he was going to fail at another diet. So what I told him to do is just take all his food and start to work to compress it into an eight-hour eating window. And what we did is push his breakfast back an hour. And then after a week of that, we pushed his breakfast back another another hour. And then by a month of pushing the breakfast back hour by hour, we started to get him into this eight-hour eating window, leaving 16 hours for fasting. In that eight-hour eating window, I want to point out, he drank like 10 sodas, he ate buffalo wings, like he ate the the bad diet that got him to 300 pounds. But just by taking his food and putting it into this eating window, um, he dropped 13 pounds that first month. So then the next month, we started to work a little bit on his food. I started to have him add in protein, still keeping him at eight-hour eating window, and then he dropped another nine pounds. Then by the third month, we were were able to start to look at soda. So I tell you all that study. Within three months, by the way, he dropped 40 pounds from just, we barely touched his food. We just worked on his eating window. So if you want to lose weight, I really feel like the first thing we've got to look at is when you eat, not what you eat. Now, I'm not telling you you have free license to eat whatever you want, but the way that our food system is right now, it has us all addicted to these high inflammatory foods. So if you're struggling to make the food change, let's start with the timing change first. Now, beyond that, there are foods that make you more hungry that you should probably avoid. And if you avoid them in your eating window, you will find that fasting gets easier and easier and you will get metabolically healthier quicker and quicker. The number one food that I think everybody needs to change is bad oils. We need to get off the the canola, the corn, the cotton seed. Those oils stay in your body when you eat a, a French fries at a at a restaurant done in vegetable oil, sitting in that rancid vegetable oil for weeks and you eat those fries, that oil actually stays in your body. It's a debate anywhere from a year to two years. A lot of people, a lot of the the fatty acid experts are saying it goes up to two years. So, um, you know, that is the first shift that needs to happen. We got to get the good oils. And then the second thing, and I, and I, you know, I love the keto movement, but if you don't want to count macros, Just make a shift over to nature's carbohydrates and get off the breads, the cakes, the pastas, the the desserty things, and lean into the fruits, the vegetables, the potatoes. Those Those are fantastic. And the third food change I would make would be I would really focus on getting the toxins out, the NutraSweets, the artificial ingredients. All of those foods are are what we know as obesogens. They block up um, the insulin uh, receptors, so you want to get those out. If you take those three food changes and you start to gradually compress your eating window till you get to this 16 hours of fasting, eight hours of eating, I have not seen somebody not lose weight that way. That I actually think we will overturn metabolic the metabolic mess we're in right now if everybody just did that. I love that. And when you talked about the oils building up in the system, it reminded me of something from your book that I really loved. The fact that sugar builds up in the system. And this happens primarily in the muscle, in the liver, and in the fat. So yeah. talk about how 
over time, somebody who's not aware and they're eating a standard American diet, they're going to they're gonna become this vessel for sugar and then how that can turn around when they begin fasting. I've heard yeah. Jason Fung talk about this previously on the show and you're the only other person I've heard talk about it this way and I just find it really helpful for me and I'm sure other people. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, fasting for me is um, – is there's a rhythm to it, whether you're a man or a woman, and the, and and it's it should become enjoyable building a fasting lifestyle. Um, when we look at the nutrition world, world, we have a lot of rigidity with it, and we have a lot of like have tos, and it becomes this like this like burden we carry when we're like, oh, I guess I'm gonna have to like start to make some food changes. Um, but what we want to look at is when we look at ourselves in the mirror. And we see fat and we villainize it. And we tell ourselves we couldn't, why, why can't we succeed at a diet when everybody else is succeeding? What I want to start this, this to answer this question with that's so important to me is that we stop saying bad things to us in the mirror and villainizing all of that fat because your intelligent body was so smart that it said, we have all this extra glucose. We've got insulin that's not able to, to push the glucose into the cells. So we have to store this excess somewhere. So I have a choice, but this is literally what your body's doing. I have a choice. I could store it in the organs, but that's going to hurt our survival, or I can store it as fat. And if I store it as fat, it won't hurt our survival as deep. And this is why when you look in that mirror, you got to thank that fat and you got to be like, okay, all that fat is, is I stored something there and now I want to unstore it. Now I want it to come out of storage. And that's what fasting does is it tells your body, hey, we are, glucose isn't coming in, blood sugar's going down, ketones are going up. Um, why don't you go find what you stored years ago? And while you're finding that and burning it and, and burning fat, I'm not going to raise glucose so that can happen. So that's that to me is the magic of what's going on for fat burning when you go into these fasted states. But I want to say one other thing about, about um, glucose and sugar that's so detrimental, especially to aging. There's a process called glycation. And glycation is where the glucose, all that excess glucose that has nowhere to go, it can't be pushed into the cell because you're insulin resistant, gets glommed onto the red blood cell. And the red blood cell's job is to carry oxygen through the body. And if you create this glycation, you create this gumming of these glucose molecules on that red blood cell, what's now going to happen is you're going to get less oxygen to every part of your, of your body, including your brain. What that means long-term is you're going to age faster, Alzheimer's, dementia, memory loss, um, you know, more, you're more prone to diabetes. And how you know if you've got this glycation going on is you look at hemoglobin A1C, is it under 5 if it's under five, you're not in a glycated state. If it's over five, you've got some glycation going on. So it's it's multifaceted, but the body has to adapt to that extra sugar. And those are the two major adaptations. Great explanation there. Yeah. Thank so you. So I want to come back to the weight loss piece. For somebody that is trying to lose weight, we we got into a lot of great stuff there, but is there any fat burning after somebody breaks the fast? So we know that if mm. we stop eating dinner, yeah. we're going to go into a fasted state until we decide to eat the next day. So we can skip breakfast. We can we can stay in fat burning. But what if we have lunch? Do we ever get a chance to burn fat again until we fast after dinner and have enough time to really get into that fasted state? Well, uh, this is best. This is a great question. Uh, this is best explained by looking at metabolic switching. And I will tell you what I'm seeing um, with, recently that has really blown me away is that once you get somebody fat adapted, so fat adapted means you eat a meal, your blood sugar goes up, your body uses that glucose for energy. Within a couple of hours, the blood sugar starts to go down and you start to switch over into ketosis. What we're seeing is people are switching over into fat, fat adaptation faster and faster and faster. The more they fast, the more they go in and out with these fasts. 
So because of that, you've trained, it's like training a dog. You've trained the dog that, okay, when blood sugar goes down, you make ketones. And we're seeing that people go in and out of ketosis, even in their eating window more and more and more because they're fat adapted. So the first trek is to get yourself to understand what ketosis feels like, to understand what it feels like to be in this fat burning st stage. The second trick is to start practicing in and out of fasting. So we've talked a lot about that. The third piece, after you've done that for some time, is you'll, be, you'll see it's hard to keep yourself out of ketosis. And to answer your question, that's where we see people keep weight off for good because they're not, their body always wants to go back to ketosis and it's always burning fat, even though they just ate a meal two hours ago. So that would be one thing. The, the second thing is food is not the enemy here. If you eat the right food, um, it's nourishing your body, which is priming every single metabolic marker in your body and making you it, it easier to go in and out of this metabolic switching. Um, so, it, and then it's all about blood sugar management. You know, can you, I've, I've put CGMs on before and I thought, could I go like a week where I don't really have my blood sugar spike? And I can, and it looks like a lot of meat and a lot of fat and, and then adding that to my fasting window. So it's when we start to go into the carbs that we're going to get more of an elevation of blood sugar and pulling us out of ketosis. So you, you could like carnivore fasting. We did this in my community where people just ate ma meat and they fasted 17 hours and they did that for five days. And literally that was the most weight loss that we ever saw our community lose in that, that period of time. And largely because, um, you know, carnivore is a form of keto and yet people were eating steaks, um, and getting great results. So those are some nuances. Earlier, we talked about different lengths of fast. We've come back to this a couple of times and we talked about what you do in a typical day for fasting, but that only gives us a picture of one day as somebody who is so tuned into this world and, and believes so much in this message of fasting. I'm curious, how do you use all those different fasts over say a year? Do you have a period yeah. of time where you go fast for, you know, five days, whatever it is, I'm curious how you plug that in over a longer period of time. Yeah, it's a great question. So women, I just want to say for the women, this is Fast Like a Girl is all about how you do just that according to your hormones. So for women, I think we need to go in and out of these six different length fasts according to our hormones. And the, I created this tool called the fasting cycle that will allow women to pick the different, the different length fasts that she wants to use and map it to her hormones. Um, for, for having put, putting that aside, once you've mastered fasting, you're getting this in and out rhythm. For both men and women, I like the, a weak approach of what I call a 5-1-1. Five, five days a week, you're doing 13 to 15 hours of fasting. One day a week, you're elongating that fast. If you can get to that 24-hour fast, fabulous. And one day a week, you're not fasting. That is a really good, solid way to start to vary your fast. Some of the people in our community have done a 4 two, one four days a week of, of the intermittent fasting, two days a week elongating the fast, and then one day a week of not fasting. You're literally, what you're trying to do is mimic what your cave ancestors did. So those are some weekly variations. Um, monthly variations, I like women to do it according to their cycle and to their hormones. I have a whole 30-day reset in there that all women of all hormonal needs can do. But on a but on a on a yearly basis, if we take these six different length fasts, I strongly feel like a three day water fast for all humans would be well uh, served, or all humans would be well served with it twice a year. And I like January and I like September. And the reason I like those two is that January, first thing, you've got the whole world doing something with their health. So it gets a lot easier. You're coming off the holidays. We're going to do a, a worldwide fast in celebration of this book this first week of January. So if you haven't done a, a three-day water fast, I might be able to talk you into that, Jesse. I don't know. Uh, so twice a year, September, it's great because you're coming off the summer, depending on what hemisphere you're in, um, and it, it really helps you course correct. So twice a year for three day, um, I think once a quarter, throwing in a 36-hour fast or a 48-hour fast is great. 
Um, I like a 24 hour fast once a week. If that's not within your reach, then I would do it at least once a month. So I, I look at it like you want to dip into these fasts and then you kind of come back to your normal rhythm and then you dip into the longer ones and then you come back depending on what healing effect you're trying to create. Yeah. I think it's really important. We went into that because they, to me, seem like all different tools on the tool belt, they depending are. on what your goals are. And I want to caveat this whole thing by it's going to depend on the individual person, what their goals are. If they have a lot of weight to lose and they're 300 pounds, they're going to have a different strategy than somebody who yes. wants to be preventative and, and maintain their weight. So yes. everybody needs to zoom out, look at this from their own goals and what they want to get out of this. Yes. But just to get an idea for people to have a template to look at. Yeah. I'm so, and I'm so glad you asked the question because you know, we want the absolute again. And every time we're looking for the absolute, we lose when it comes to healthcare. So the, in the book, the six different fasts, what I do is I show you the science and then I show you the reasons you would pick those fasts. And then it's up to you whether you, and, it, and it, I even, when I read the audio book, the sound engineers were men and they were like, the, this is a good book for men too. I'm like, yeah, the first section especially has all the science. So don't shy away from it, men, if, if, it's, if you're wanting to know why you would go into these six six different fasts. But, but think of them as a tool. I think of them like a Swiss army knife. Like sometimes you pull out the screwdriver, sometimes you pull out the big knife, um, depending on what, sometimes you pull out the tweezers. What are you going to use? Um, where we have gone wrong in the fasting world is that we started to look at it being a one size fits all. And that is the whole premise I am trying to break apart. It is a bio-individual process. You can't tell anybody how to fast. You've got to decide for yourself what fasting tool you want for what healing effect you want to have occur in your body. Great point. And before we part ways, I know we only have a few minutes left, but we did talk about for a woman who is still having her cycle, what it would look like over 30 days to fast, different... Mm -hmm periods there. We got into perimenopause and we were talking about your story. I want to yep. make sure we come back to menopause now. So at what age does that occur? So people can be aware. And then hormones are going to change in a big way for women at that point. What does yeah. fasting look like during that phase of life? Yeah. So, um, they, that's also so needed, this conversation. And, um, you know, what I find with the menopausal women, well, let's talk about when it starts. It's a menopause is officially a year after when you're, when you haven't had a cycle for a year. So, and the best time, by the way, this is a big piece of what I want to get out into the world. The healthiest time for a woman to go into menopause is somewhere between 52 and 55, because it means that she can keep her estrogen levels up and estrogen is cardioprotective and it's protective to the brain. So the fact that women are going into menopause earlier is, should be of concern to all of us. So I want to try to get women going as late as possible. Now, having said that, let's talk to the woman who hasn't had a cycle in over a year. So your estrogen is at its lowest, your progesterone's at its lowest. Um, so you're going to want to dip in either to the weekly formula that I gave, like a 5-1-1. So five days a week, you know, or really six days a week, you're focused on estrogen because that is a really big hormone we need to keep up for uh, neurocognition and cardiovascular health. And one day a week, you're going to do a progesterone day where you don't fast and you raise glucose. If you know you're struggling with a lot of progesterone loss, you have a lot of anxiety, you're not sleeping, you may do two days a week where you are not um, fasting and the rest of the time you are fasting. Because the tricky part is you need to be able to fast to help estrogen and you need to be able to not fast to help progesterone. So you might try two days a week to, to pacify progesterone and five days a week where you are pacifying um, estrogen. So that's one strategy. Now, I'm going to totally trip you out uh, on, on a concept that I've been talking about, and I didn't talk about it in the book, so it's really exciting to talk about it here. We do have some evidence that women cycle with the moon. Now, the problem that we have is that our, we, don't all, you know, you, we don't all cycle with the moon because blue light is interfering with our hormonal ability to adapt to the moon cycle, but a lot of women cycle with the moon. So what we tell women in our community is at the full moon, 
you, that would think of that as ovulation. Most women, if we didn't have TVs, we didn't have computers, we didn't have light bulbs, we were back in the primal days, I am sure that those women all ovulated at the same time. And it was at the full moon. So in the book, I give this 30-day reset, and I'm encouraging menopausal women to really look at that part of ovulation and time it to the moon, and then we can start to work where there may be a natural rhythm that is occurring. Um, It's a total nuanced kind of geeky thing, but it's fun to think about that we would actually be so connected to the earth and to the moon that way. That's beautiful. And one more population before we part ways is the men. You talk yes. about, I believe in your book, you said it's a 24-hour cycle for men, so totally different than women. Yeah. Given everything we've talked about today, how does it work for men when they want to plan out their fasts? So we know from research, men can raise testosterone by like 2,000% with fasting. We also know that men, you guys get surges of testosterone every something like 15 minutes. So you, your hormones are really on a 24-hour cycle to your point, whereas women, we get testosterone in a five-day period during ovulation. So ours is really, our hormones are more on a monthly cycle. So I actually, as much as I hate saying this, Men, you thrive with fasting a lot more than we do as women. Um, you're going to get these results that I'm talking about a lot quicker. And I'm, and I'm going to say, so have compassion for the women in your life who may not lose as much weight um, as you're going to lose, um, but you, you, will, you will take fasting to a whole new level. So the only thing you have to think about is to make sure that you're not fasting all the time. We are not made to fast all the time. We are made for feast, famine, cycling. So every few days, just don't fast as long. Step out of fasting. A 5-1-1 may be your jam. I've already explained what that is. Um, But you need to have at least one to two days a week where you're not fasting, and then the rest of the time you can fast. So, and it doesn't have to be time to anything other than, um, you know, making sure that you step out every once in a while. All right, Mindy, really enjoyed the conversation. We covered so much in here. The book's amazing. Excited for you to get this message out to the world. We'll continue to because you've been doing it in such a big way. Thank you for coming on the show. We're going to link up the book. We're going to link up your social media, your website, everything in the show notes. Again, thank you for coming on the show. Oh, thank you, Jesse. And I'll be excited to do that three-day water fast with you in January. I'm going to hold you accountable for that. I might be up for it. Is Does yeah. that include coffee or no? You can do coffee. I'll let you okay. do I'll not let that you I'm do Not that I'm opposed to letting coffee go for a few days. I'm just curious. Yep. You know, you said you water. You can do so. coffee. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to do, we're, I'm actually going to lead people through a three-day webinar. And so you, you can hop on the, on the webinar and I'm going to explain all the little nuances like that. But for your brain right now, you can do coffee. All right. I think that's going to get a lot more people in. So awesome. good to hear. Beautiful. Thanks Thank again, you. Mindy. Really enjoyed this. Take care. Now that you're done my conversation with Mindy, you're going to want to stick around here and catch my chat with Cynthia. There's a lot more to learn about intermittent fasting. I'll see you over there. On a lot of levels, I'm truly grateful because intermittent fasting gave me back my life. Like I say all the time, I feel more energetic than I did 15 years ago.